Um, I promise to tell you things you can do with 120 domain key drive. Basically, will tell you one thing you can do with them. Uh, there are actually other things you can do with them, but um, the particular thing I want to talk about is something you can build with them that closes up, but it closes up in a sense that is four dimensional. So we have to wrap our heads around that. Um, and I promised that I would bring a dodecahedron to uh, illustrate, in case you didn't know what a dodecahedron was, um, and I didn't. And in a way, it's good because the, uh, we're going to go through the process of understanding what a dodecahedron is. I mean, we know what a dodecahedron is first as a sort of a model of the process of understanding what this bigger thing I'm going to make is, right? So we're going to start with if you've never seen a dodecahedron and you can only draw pictures on the blackboard, so you're kind of like a two dimensional creature, right? How can you possibly wrap your head around this thing? So what is a dodecahedron? Well, it's made out of pentagons. Okay, so let's draw Regular pentagons. A regular dodecahedron is made out of regular pentagons. Okay, so there's one. Um, and so you want, you know, you need to do, we'll go back and forth. Let's, let's, let's first indulge ourselves and actually use our three dimensional visualization skills and just say, suppose I took um, some more dodecahedron and start try to pass patch them onto this, right? You may or may not have done this in your life, and actually you should do this. I have to, you know, go home tonight and cut out some dodecahedron and start taking them together, right? So you can take, of course, you can put another one and take it on right here. I'm not, I'm purposely not being very accurate. Um, let's see, suppose I put it, well, uh, just to be safe, I can certainly put one here. Can I fit another one in here or not? Well, the real issue is what are these interior angles, right? Okay. Let's just go ahead and do a quick calculation. You all know how to calculate the interior angles of a, of a regular polygon? Um, the, you may remember as a formula, but if you don't remember the formula, the quick and easy way to do it is don't do interior angles, do exterior angles, right? Because exterior angles, if you've never seen, I don't know at what point in your life you learned this trick, but you may never have learned this trick before, if you think about the exterior angles, right? Well, what, what do they do? They obviously add up to a full rotation, right? Because the, the 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 vector, right, that you get along each side just keeps turning and turning and turning, and it does one full turn. So the sum of the exterior angles is obviously two pi. Okay, how many of you saw that before in your life? Well, not everybody, so that's good, right? So that's 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 a good thing to have learned, and that and you should remember that. So if you want to if you want to can't remember something about the interior angles, think about exterior angles, right? Um, so then, the sum of the exterior angles in this case, well, each exterior angle is 2 pi over 5, right? And then I want to know the interior, so that's an alpha, and then that's alpha, and then beta is going to be uh, pi minus that, pi minus 2 pi over 5, or um, 10 pi over 5, what am I doing? 5 pi over 5 minus 3, 2 pi over 5, so 3 pi over 5, okay? Um, so that's what this is, 3 pi over 5, 3 pi over 5. So is there room for another one? Well, yes, because I, if I squeeze another one, it just barely squeezes in, right? Then if I put another 3 pi over 5, that's 9 pi over 5, which is less than 2 pi. Okay? So yes, it looks like there's room there, and it's, it doesn't do it really good. Really and so you can squeeze your, you can fit 5, uh, pentagons around the outside. And now, um, well, that's kind of bad also because kind of it's gaps and everything. But you're building something. You're, you're now three dimensions available to you. So if you, the, the point is seeing that there's a little gap. It doesn't matter what the gap is. As long as there's some gap, right, then by bending these down, you can close the gap, right? Any questions there? Because so you can close the gap by, by taking these outer flaps and bending them down, right? And then, um, you will have produced something involving six pentagons. Okay. Now I'll draw you the picture of the full. Um, well, let, let me draw sort of a perspective drawing of what you get at that point. Oh, please stop me if, if you're lost. Kind of, kind of, kind of, the way I lecture, I kind of tend to well, count on. It's actually worth me asking which flaps are you talking about? I'm, fl I, I'm talking about these outer. I'm talking about. The pentagonal outer. I'm thinking of those as flaps. I'm, I want to bend oh. the five. I'm keeping the middle one. Thank you for asking. Keep the middle one where it is, and then I glued five pentagons around its edge, or taped five pentagons around its edge, 
and now that's flat on the table. I lift this up and bend the outer five pentagons down. So the lines where you're bending it are around the perimeter. Yes, yeah. these are the lines I'm bending. I'm like bend, bend, bend. Okay. So, so when I bend, cardboard this edge will. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, bending just along the seam, right? And when I so in other words, each each pentagon remains flat and rigid by itself. Okay. And then these two edges come together, right? And then I can put a piece of tape there. But now it's no longer in a lane flat, right? Okay. So that's um, so we can draw we draw sort of a picture of that again. Pentagon. Well, the best way to draw a pentagon is draw a five-point star first. But um, actually, let me just ask you this: Who knows how to construct a regular pentagon? Not really a compass, just a, an easy way. You must. Have, how many? I don't know how many of you've seen this. You know, tie a knot in a strip of paper. Okay, if you take a long strip of paper and you tie the simplest knot in it. Increase down. with a strip of paper. And then you start, you, this also you should go home and do, right? And then you start sort of creasing it down, and uh, you know, eventually what you'll discover is that someone's going to do it and pass it around. And you'll find a regular pentagon that's perfectly aligned. Uh, I, I, can't, I, will, I will not attempt to draw it on the board, but he's going to do it. So that's, that's if you ever need a regular pentagon. Uh, I mean, there is a ruler of compass construction that's horrendous. Um, so, okay, so I'm going to draw it now as if I'm looking straight at it, and I've now bent these outer flaps down, so they sort of, uh, they now are, are shortened, right, because I'm looking at that in perspective, and so, and those side pentagons are foreshortened also, because I'm looking at that in perspective. Okay, that's the picture of the front of the dodecahedron. Okay, can you buy that perspective drawing? Okay, so these are regular pentagons, but they're tilted at an angle away from me. Okay. And now, um, what I'm going to say is, you do exactly the same thing on the other side. You do the same thing again. Make another copy of exactly the same thing. Glue it from the back. And, well, so suppose you take another one and put it on behind. If you just try and smash it together, it's not actually going to work. Uh, let me ask you this to see if you're with me on the intuition here. Is uh, the perimeter of that shape I just drew, does it lie in a flat plane or not? It does not. So these points are further back than these points, right? Okay? Right? Because this distance is longer than this distance, so those points are further back. So if I were to look at it from the side, I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 points. But they, they go up, down, up, down, like a zigzag around. Okay, got that? Yes? All right. So if I try to do exactly the same thing, glue out behind, glue it here, I'd sort of have a problem. But the, the trick is then to take the thing on the back and rotate it a little bit and it clicks into place. Okay, so I'm going to draw the back of it now, and hopefully that'll help you understand what I just said. Um, so the back of it, I'm going to draw as if, I, as if I could see through this thing, but I, you know, the edges are what I'm drawing, right? So the, in behind there will be, I'm going to sort of exaggerate the perspective a little bit so that the, but if you stare at that, the thing in the back is just exactly the same thing as I built in the front, but rotated by, how much exactly? Rotated by rotated by a tenth of a full rotation, right? Because originally, if I did this thing, just if I just, if I took this front six pentagon piece and just reflected it around this plane so that it was here, then, uh, you know, these, I mean, then, 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 then the points would, have, would not have lined up right. But these points are, there's ten of them around here, and so I just rotate by one tenth of a click, you know, to one tenth of a rotation, and they click together, okay? And there's the dodecahedron, and that's also useful because, um, you know, everybody learns at some point how to draw a cube. Maybe you learn how to draw a tetrahedron, but you never learn how to draw a dodecahedron, so now you know. Okay. Um, uh, you do eventually learn, like, 
it's not taught in mainstream, of course. Um, so there's a dodecahedron. Twelve faces. They're all regular pentagons. You happy with it? And now you should never touch that particular part of the board again. Right. So we've got this picture up here. Um, no, I, it's in your head. Now, so. um, I'm going to draw another um, picture of it, though. So here, here's um, here's one useful way to think about polyhedra is um, another useful way to think about polyhedra is to think about them as being actually living uh, these these lines that I draw. It's actually being on the surface of a sphere. Okay. All you have to do. So one thing you could do is you could, for example, put a light source at the very center, and then put a sphere on the outside of everything, and look at the shadow cast on the sphere by all these all these edges, right? And then you'll get something on the sphere made up of you'll get some collection of straight lines on the sphere, I mean, namely great circles, right? Okay, arcs of great circles dividing the sphere into spherical pentagons. Okay, um, and that's a useful perspective. And um, let me ask you this now. I don't know where you all are coming from. How many have ever heard of stereographic projection? Okay. So if you haven't, that's fine. So this stereographic projection is a useful way to transfer um, pictures from the sphere to the plane. Okay. So this thing, you know, this pentagon, uh, this dodecahedron, I will, I, I'm not going to attempt to curve the edges just right so you think it was on the sphere, but I want you to imagine that these edges are now sort of slightly bowed out so they're on the surface of the sphere, right? And then I would like to transfer that to, to a f completely flat picture, right? This is sort of a bad picture because there's stuff in front of other stuff, right? And that's why that's problematic. So another picture, but, but that on the other hand corresponds to how we actually see, so that's useful. So another picture is using what's called stereographic projection. And stereographic projection is a projection from the sphere to the plane. So I'm going to draw the, you think of the unit sphere inside R3 and the XYZ space, and then think of the XY plane in there. And what I do is I take, to figure out where the, you know, this, I'm making a map, right? This is actually a pretty bad map in general, um, for actually making maps, but it does have one really awesome feature. Um, so I take a point on the, on the sphere, and I want to know, where should its image be on the map, right? You know, this is, uh, you know, Athens, Georgia. Where is it on the, on the plane, okay? So I, I go to the North Pole, and I collect a straight line from the North Pole to Athens, and then I continue until I hit the equatorial plane, the XY plane, right? And then that's the image of So this is a function. This is the point P. This is F and P. This is a function from the sphere to the plane. Well, except not really, because there's one point that never gets to the plane which is the North Pole itself, okay? So it's a function from the sphere minus the North Pole to the plane. Question? Isn't that sort of what maps do, what we already do to use globes to make maps, and hence why, like, Greenland is so huge on a map, when it really is? Yeah, like so the typical map makes the North Pole into a straight line at the top of the page, right? This is far worse. This sends the North Pole off to infinity. The North Pole, the North Pole becomes a circle off at infinity, right? And you know Greenland is has infinite. You know, the 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 the, the uh, Arctic ice cap has infinite area. Okay, in this map, right? The, uh, the, this map is awesome for Antarctica. Okay? Um, and uh, however, one thing, and I don't, you know, there's a whole another topic in here that you should learn if you haven't learned. The amazing thing about stereo, this is called stereographic projection. I actually don't know the origin of that. Terminology it suggests that it has something to do with, um, you know, two things, right? Stereograph or stereographic vision or something. I, don't, I have no idea why, where that, why it's called stereographic vision, but it is. Um, it's very important in complex analysis, and one of the reasons it's so important in complex analysis is that it, it preserves angles. Okay, and if it preserves, so this preserves angles. So if I have two little things there and an angle between them, they make, you know, if I have a little triangle or something, it's an angle. the angle between them will you know, those edges may be terribly distorted, but the angles will be the same. And the other thing is, it sends circles to circles. But that's actually a consequence of preserving angles, because you can think of a circle as being something where you're turning at a constant angle, right? And so if you're turning at a constant angle, and you have a map that preserves angles, then you'll continue to turn at a constant angle. So it sends circles to circles. Um, 
So what I would like to do is try to draw a stereographic projection picture of the dodecahedron, and then very quickly move on to higher dimensions, okay? Um, because that's going to be the, the, the motivation. So um, what we would imagine maybe is that that first pentagon is, say, uh, surrounding the South Pole. Okay, so this is sort of a view from the South Pole, right? And now I'm going to try to draw a stereographic projection. So again, the, if if you think about it, if I've got a pentagon surrounding the perfectly placed around the South Pole, and I project it into some kind of pentagon inside the circle there, right? Inside the equatorial circle. So again, we'll just start a picture with a pentagon. Um, but I'm going to make the space a little bit small. Okay, so now what about the, well, actually, but not straight lines, right? Um, not straight lines. Oh, oh, here's another. Let's, let's do this as well. It's slightly bowed out, right? Ever so slightly. But they're not, they don't, they definitely meet at some angle, right? They're not, it's not just a circle, right? So these are arcs of circles. Meeting at some angle. Now, let's see if we can figure out what that angle is. It's bigger than the interior angle of a Euclidean, uh, than the interior angle of a Euclidean pentagon, right? Because it's bowed out. Actually, you can figure out exactly what it, what, what it should be because how many pentagons meet at one of these corners? Three, right? It's perfect symmetry around this. We have to be able to a few different things about that, right? I mean, it's not entirely obvious that it's symmetric around the corners of this construction. But anyway, there's symmetry around that. And so um, whatever's happening, it's, you know, it's the same. You've got three, at every point on the sphere, you've got three of these spherical pentagons, meaning at a point when there's with these spherical interior angles, so you've got the two pi, right, divided up into three equal parts. So this has actually got to be two pi over three interior angle. Okay, so you could actually construct this, right? You could actually figure out where to put, you've got two points here, you want to draw this with a compass. You should be able to figure out where the center of this arc of the circle is, so that it, you know, so that the angle it makes, well, if you like, so this angle is pi over 3, and then this angle will be pi over 3. So that's a fun exercise to do. But, you know, you, don't, you definitely don't want to put the centers right here, because then you're drawing a circle. So this, this arc is going to have a center out here somewhere, and then this arc will have a center out here somewhere. It's a fun exercise to figure out where the center should be, so this is 2 pi over 3. Okay? What about the next edge is going out? Actually, it turns out the next edges are going to be arcs of circles, which are great circles passing through the North Pole. Just by, again, by symmetry, this should be going up. And so that corresponds to going out. And when I said circles go to circles, but there's a special case which is circles in the North Pole, do you think they go to? Straight lines. Okay, because they go off to infinity. They're like circles to infinity. So those will be straight lines still. And this will be 2 pi over 3 and 2 pi over 3. So again, we're really just doing the same thing. Now I need to, um, I need another 2 pi over 3 angle, because this, this thing. I'm not going to try to, you know, I'm not going to do this perfectly accurately, right? But I don't know exactly what the right length is here. It's a fun exercise again to try and do it. We want some arc of circle here, so that's 2 pi over 3. And that's 2 pi over 3. Okay. And, um, okay. Now I'm going to stop trying to be realistic about my angles, right? But the point is you're going to get something that looks sort of like that. I'm going to have 1, 2, Three, I mean something like this and something like this, right, for my next. So this is supposed to be a pentagon. One, two, three, four, five. This angle should again should be two pi over three. I'm gonna have this, this, this. That angle should be two pi over three. This, 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 this. Okay. So now I'm doing pretty good. Now I need to. Uh, now I'm gonna run out of space altogether. Um, but what, what should happen, the point is now I'm not going to flip around back. This thing's just going to keep going flat. I flatten the whole thing out. So I'm going to, again, the next edges, this edge here, right, which is in the back, is now flipped out. But again, it's, a, it's sort of an arc of a circle that goes to the North Pole. So it's, again, a straight line going out, straight line going out, straight line out, straight line out, straight line out. And I actually really wish that I could finish this off nicely and started the whole thing and made it smaller because... How many? One, two, three, four. So I only need to draw one more edge to make this closest pentagon off, right? This, I'm trying to draw this pentagon here. And I've drawn four of its edges already. 
So I just need one more edge, which is something like that. And then I need another edge here to close this off. So I have one, two, three, four, five. Similarly, another edge to close that off. Another edge. Close that off, and one more edge up there. Okay, yeah. I've got this right. So now that accounts for basically uh, the five around the edge of the, the five uh, flaps around the back. Correct. We need one final pentagon to put this whole thing together, and it's got to go from the five points most on the outside, and Correct. yet still connect them. Correct. Okay. So to stretch out infinitely. Yes. Yeah, so what do you rest? Do you think? So first, the first thing is to observe that I've got. And let's count the pentagons I have so far. Right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Right? I'm missing one. The good thing about this so far is that the outer boundary of what I've drawn so far really does have five edges to it. Right? One, two, three, four, and five. I can plan it well. Right? Five. And remember, these are the images of arcs of great circles projected by the stereographic projection down. They are arcs of circles in the plane, but they're centered somewhere, and it's fun to try and figure out where they are. So this really does, these, these are quote unquote straight lines on the sphere, turned in blue. Okay. The complement of this picture, everything else in the plane off to infinity, well, remember I said this, that we're looking at this view from the South Pole. So the South Pole is here in the front plane, the North Pole is there in the back plane, right? Remember stereographic projection, which I erased, where does the North Pole go? Off to infinity. Where is a small uh, circle around the North Pole, a small disk around the North Pole, right? Gets spread, gets flipped inside out and spread all the way out to an infinite um, exterior of a disk, right? And so that's precisely what we have. This final region all the way out here, going all the way out to infinity forever, is that last pentagon in the back. So it covers the plane? So it covers the plane, right? The image, I mean, so this stereographic projection, remember, let me draw it again. Stereographic projection is a great way to make maps if all you care about is angles and you have an infinite sheet of paper, okay? Um, because, um, uh, and, all you, and you love circles, right? <laughs> circles are really dear to heart, right? You don't care about, you know, squiggly lines or anything else, but circles, you want to be able to recognize circles, you want to be able to measure angles, and you've got an infinite amount of paper. Because this, this as you get, I just reiterate again, you, if you look at the, remember, what you do is you take a point, connect it to the North Pole, extend that line, see where it gets the plane. So if your point is very, very close to the North Pole, you have to go way out before you get the plane. Okay. Weren't, weren't maps... Um, didn't like sailors in the days of yore use maps that that were kind of like that because that's. I think you mean like Mercator projections, preserved direction. Mm -hmm. so oh, okay. Yeah. So. Okay. So um. All right. So now now we're gonna jump to jump to the warp scene. Okay. Um, and uh, we're gonna do the same thing with that. Um, so we're going to see what we can build with um, building. So we take one of them. Now, now there's, I'm going to stop. I'm, not, I'm probably not going to draw very much from here on out. Right? Um, and you really need to just focus on the visualization process. The first thing I could do is just forget about trying to do something in higher dimensions. I could just try to glue dodecahedra together in three-dimensional, ordinary Euclidean three-dimensional space, R3. Just like we started building the dodecahedron by gluing pentagon, we tried to just do it, see what we could do. You know, we, we, we sort of, what did we do? We started by putting a single dodecahedron and then five of them around it, and we were sort of, maybe we were hoping we'd just maybe tile the plane, right? Make something flat. But we didn't because we had these annoying gaps. So we fixed those gaps by bending into the third dimension. Okay? 
that's sort of the idea of what's going to happen here. But let's let's not worry about the gaps too much at the moment. Let's just sort of try to build something. Well, um, here's something you can easily do. You can easily take one dodecahedron and, and then take another dodecahedron and glue it face to face, right, front to back, right. So you could have two deck, one, one dodecahedron in front, and actually you could easily put in one in the back as well, right. And you could just keep going, or you can make an infinitely long tube of these. And it's sort of, it's, this is, what you want to visualize now is that there actually is a little, this, this tube is twisting a little bit. That's kind of important to understand. I'm making a long, oh, or a long I mean, tower, if you like, and they'll go up, right? So put one dodecahedron on the table, and put one on top. The fact that there's a, a, a um, the fact that the front face and the back face don't line up exactly, but are off by a one tenth of full rotation, means that if you if you put one deck deck no deck you down here, put the next one on, and have, it's it's shifted by an angle of two pi over ten, right? And then the next one will be shifted by two pi over ten again, and then two pi over ten again, and then two pi over ten again, and so on. Okay. And so, if you put ten of them in a, on, one on top of another, then the top the top one will be um, oriented correctly again. Yes. Okay. So a stack of ten dodecahedra will have the top face oriented the same as the bottom face. Okay. So the eleven, uh, ten up from the top will. Have okay. The same. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so one way to think about it, though, is if I wanted, to, if I could somehow, um, okay, so let's just keep that in mind, right? If I stack 10, 10 on top, no, I mean, 10 dodecahedra, right? I claim that, yeah. I concur. Yeah. Is that the, the, top the top one is oriented to exact, to lines up perfectly with the bottom. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So 10 dodecahedra. 10 dodecahedra. Um, and uh, because... When you go up one, you rotate by two pi over ten. So when you go up ten, you rotate by two pi. Okay. Um, and uh, now the other thing to just try to imagine is is let's say you have you already put one on the front, and now let's put one on the side. Right? Okay. So I could I could sort of try to put one out on, on say attached to this side. Maybe I could almost draw that. Uh, I've done this in the past, but I won't do it. So stick one on the side here. Right? Um, now, another take-home exercise that I'm to do is to try and calculate the dihedral angle between two faces of the node. Who's that? Um, I don't remember. Okay. I remember. The, I remember the essential fact. Oh, oh, oh! You mean what is the definition of dihedral? I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's, I, you know, I should have. There's a there's a great prop for this, which I don't have, which is a, you know one of those blackboard compasses, right? So if you have planes, is this right? Well, that isn't actually the prop I wanted. Prop I wanted, but the, the first prop I wanted that that's that's an essential. Let me get that first. So this is you know here's two planes. Here's an angle between them. Okay. Okay. How do you measure the angle? Right. Well. Um, you would like to get a number. What we do know is how to measure angles between the lines. This one, right? Well, so here's the problem. I mean, I'd like, so I'll use my elbows for problem, right? What's the angle between these two walls? What do you think it should be? 90 degrees, right? Well, I claim no, it's like 30 degrees, right? Because I can just put my arm, elbow, into a 30 degree angle and then fit it in there perfectly, right? Okay. Or I can make it 20 degrees, right? Or I can make it 60 degrees. Or I can make it 90 degrees, right? Actually, could I make it any larger than 90 degrees? And if you keep going, it's going to get smaller again, right? What if you want to run a few? Ah, yeah, good point, good point. Right. Um, so, uh, um, so you need some convention. convention. Otherwise, you have no hope of talking about an angle. The convention is slice, it, slice the two planes with a third plane perpendicular to both planes. Perhaps perpendicular to the line of intersection. And then in that third plane that's perpendicular to, to that line of intersection, these two planes trace out lines, and there you measure the angle. And that's just an unambiguous convention. Why 90 degrees? Well, 90 degrees is halfway between everything else, right? 
you know, you slice it this way or this way or this way, it seems sort of arbitrary. 90 degrees is the only one that doesn't seem arbitrary, right? It's a good, you know, it's, it's, it's right smack in the middle. So it's the most natural thing to choose. Okay, so um, that's what the word dihedral angle means. It's just a natural way to measure angle between the planes. Okay? And so if we're going to see, here's the point, if we're going to put a dodecahedron here and another one here, then the question is, along this edge, what happens? I've got one here and some angle between them. And then I've got another one here and some angle between them, and one here and some angle between them. Is there a gap? Do they fit perfectly? Do they, is there not even room for the third? Maybe, maybe once I put the first, this first one on, there's no room for the third. Just as we were worried about that with the Pentagon, right? With the Pentagon, we put one here. And then we put one here, and you know, by calculating, I mean, it doesn't look very convincing the way I'm doing it, but by calculating angles, we discovered there was there was just barely room for the two of them, and unfortunately, they didn't tie the plane at that point, right? Um, so, how, how do you, you know, there's lots of different interesting ways to try and figure out how you would go about um, finding that dihedral angle. Um, I won't do the calculation with you, that's what I said, I don't remember, right? What it is. Um, the, uh, I think the nicest way to do it is to think about um, that pyramid there. So first you need to, okay, you say the side lengths are one. Then you need to know inside a regular pentagon of side length one, what's the length of this, this sort of diagonal of the pentagon. And once you figure that out, then you can, you can ignore everything else, the rest of the pentagon, and say, suppose I have a pyramid, right? whose side length, you know, called the side length x, whatever it is, whose side lengths are x on the base, and side lengths going up are 1, right? And then you have to figure out, you have to find, sort of somehow figure out how to use that to slice, find a plane perpendicular to this. I don't know, that may not be the best way. You want to find some way, often we're do, for dihedral angle calculations, a lot of times what you want to do is slice some little piece off of the, off of the polyhedral angle. Okay. I know. Anyway, the upshot of, of it is that this dihedral angle, between two planes, called an alpha, is less than, the most important thing is less than 2 pi over 3. Okay. Um, uh, but it's bigger than 2 pi That's what I want to say. Which means there's, you can fit 3 in, but you can't fit 4 in. Okay. And there's some gap when you fit 3 in. Okay. Um, and Okay, so you're, you're, you're visualizing, I've got a poly, uh, dodecahedron, another dodecahedron, and then another dodecahedron here. If you like, sort of looking, you know, sliced edge on, I've got a slice of a dodecahedron <coughs> here, slice of a dodecahedron there, slice one there, and a little gap between them. Okay. Um, so, even though so even though there's six spaces sort of around here, you cannot hope to fit a dodecahedron around each of them? Uh, ah, no. Um, let me see, is that what I want to say? No, you can't. Because anytime along each edge, you can fit one here and one here, and there will be a little gap between them. Mm -hmm. So in fact, you can hope to take a single dodecahedron and glue onto the outside of it 12 other dodecahedron. Mm -hmm. okay? And that, so that would be the entirely analogous model of that, that um, pentagon with five pentagon pentagonal flaps sticking out. The flaps are now the 12 dota each sticking out. Okay. Um, all right. And now what do we want to do? So what's one dimension go another? We want to bend somehow to make those things join up. Okay. Um, now there, there's, there's a couple of different ways to think about this. Um, I'm going to try to finish in 10 minutes, because 50 minutes is quite a long time to sit and think about this. So I won't be able to tell you everything, so there's some, a lot pushed under the rug in calculations here, OK? Um, first of all, I, we would like to somehow get some analog of the, the, the stereographic projection picture we drew, OK? And again, I'm not going to, um, probably not even going to draw it, right? So there, but, but, what, but the first thing is, what, what stereographic projection of what, right? What sphere, OK? 
Okay, that's that's step one. So uh, let me ask you the next question: How many of you came to Niles Johnson's talk on off vibration? All right. So some of you have have a, a head start because you thought about something all the way through the three sphere. Okay. Um, and those of you who didn't, I'll tell you what the three sphere is. It has a very simple definition. It's called S three three dimensions. It doesn't mean it lives inside three dimensional space. It means it is intrinsically three dimensional. Okay. It is the set of points x, y, z, t, let's say, to use some other coordinate, in R4, satisfying the equation x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus t squared equals 1. That's the unit 3 sphere. Okay. So the, the normal sphere, we don't call it a three-dimensional sphere. We call it a two-dimensional sphere. Okay. You might object to that. A lot of people do because it obviously lives inside three-dimensional space. But the reason we call it two-dimensional, we call it the two-dimensional sphere because a creature living on the surface of it, it can only move forwards and backwards and left and right. right? So it, it, the, the degrees of freedom for life on a sphere are two-dimensional and not three-dimensional. Okay? That you only need latitude and longitude to specify your position. Okay? Um, so this is something which is, lives inside four-dimensional space R4 being, you know, so what is R4? Just like scratch your head on that for a bit. Um, you know, the pure mathematics, no intuition definition of it is ordered for two points of real dimension. Okay? The set of ordered lists of four real numbers. What is that? Okay. Um, however, that's actually not such a bad definition for the following reason. In fact, R27, you know, is order 27 tuples. Well, you know, people think that's very mysterious, but it's all around you, right? I mean, when you, anytime, and statisticians especially, they're, they're the, the worst like, high-dimensional geometers, right? Because they go around and they, they measure, you know, they ask your, your, you know, your waist size and your income and your mother's income and, you know, hat size and so on, and they get 27 numbers about you and they located you at a point in 27 dimensional space. Okay? So they're doing high dimensional geometry all the time. So this is not really particularly mysterious. The other thing is, of course, you live in, you live in R4, right? Well, except there may be some curvature, whatever. But at least locally, you need to specify your position. You need to indicate your time, which is why we use T for the edge. Okay? Um, so it's not that mysterious of an object at all, except that you can't see it with our eyes. Um, however, you can do exactly the same. You can define straight lines. You know, this is just a, just a vector space, right? You can define straight lines between points. And what's the what's the north pole? The north pole is point zero 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 one. Okay. What's the equivalent of the x y plane, the equatorial plane? That's the set of points x y z zero. Right. And there's something called stereographic projection, which is a function from s three minus we delete. 0, 0, 0, 1. We, so we think of this as being R3 to R3. That's stereographic projection. Okay? It is defined algebraically exactly the same way. If you have a point in X3 which is not this point, then there's a unique line in R4 connecting that point to 0, 0, 0, 1. You just do the algebra and you find where does it intersect x, y, z, 0, and then it's x, y, z coordinates, that's the point in R3. And that's a perfectly reasonable projection. It has all the same properties, it takes angles to angles, circles to circles, and it takes spheres to spheres, and chunks of slices of spheres to slices of spheres. Okay? And so, um, the natural thing to do is to imagine if we want to sort of draw our picture of what did we do last time? We, we tried to, I, I'm trying to see if I can build something in, in R4 or on S3 that's made out of S3 versions of the dodecahedron that fit together in some sense to cover the surface of S3, whatever that means. Okay? So to begin with it, you would want to sort of, instead of, remember we, we start, we sort of bow these lines out to make arcs of great circles. You would now bow the faces out so that each face, each pentagonal face, would be a chunk of a sphere. Okay? And when you do that, then these dihedral angles 
instead of being somewhere between 2 pi over 4 and 2 pi over 3, you can expand them just a little bit so they become exactly 2 pi over 3, and then they'll fit together 3 around an edge. Okay, now that's hard to see also, but let me, uh, let, let's get to the 120. And so now this is the part where I'm going to, um, so I, I, so the claim is that if you do this, if you just start uh, gluing um, donut eater together, say three around an edge. So what that might mean is that every time along each edge of the dodecahedron, you put three of them. There's three, there's two others, right? Um, okay, then if you do this, the claim is that um, uh, after using 120 of them, and they all end up being on the surface of the three-dimensional three sphere, on this three sphere. So you can, another way to say it is, you can take out, you can divide this set up into 120 pieces, each of which is a spherical dodecahedron inside this spherical geometry. Its faces are, are, are spherical pentagons made out of pentagonal chunks of two-dimensional spheres inside of S3. Okay? Let me try to explain where the 120 comes from and stop. Okay? So 120 is going to come back from this stack of 10 of them. Okay? So what happens is you take your first one. You put one in front of it. And now remember that in, in, uh, in that picture we drew of the stereographic projection of the dodecahedron, the original dodecahedron, you made of pentagons, right? The, when we put the first one, the second one, we sort of, if we stuck one, took one pentagon in the middle and put the second one on the side, it was pretty distorted, right? And then the next one got even bigger, right? So there's sort of the pentagons get bigger and bigger as you go out until there's this one that's out of infinity. Well, we want to do the same thing here. We're going to put one in front, and now it's going to be somehow distorted because we're doing stereographic projection. So we put this one in front, and we put another one, and it gets bigger. And every time we're rotating by 2 pi over 10, right? At some point, let's say after this is 1, 2, 3, 4, the fifth one, we want to imagine that it's so big that it wraps around behind, because it's gone out to infinity. Just like that exterior on the, on the dodecahedron went out to infinity, and it comes back behind. And then we put four more, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, well, 5, whatever. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, right? So this is the first one, and then the middle, the, whatever, track, the middle, you know, I've got 10 of them. One of them is right here in the middle. One of them contains infinity, so it's an inside-out dodecahedron. And then, but the fact that you've done exactly 2 pi over 10 rotation, when you've done 10 of them, you come back, they line up perfectly. That's one chain of 10 dodecahedron. Okay? Now, next thing to observe, okay? This is the next visualization step, is that, um, Let's think about what's going on, on the outside of that chain of donut ether, right? Each one of those, I've got, um, if, if you think about the, if you sort of looked at this chain of donut ether, sort of faces go out, in, out, in, out, in, as you go. They go out, in, and they sort of twist around as well as you go up, okay? Um, so, there will be this sort of spiral around the outside of it, where, um, these spaces sort of have gaps in them. And so you could imagine that you could take another one and another one of these chains of 10 dodecahedra and spiral it around it so it fits perfectly. Okay, now this is, you're just going to believe me on this, okay? So you could, there's another one that fit, there's a spiral, and there are actually, how many spirals do you think there will be? Well, um, it turns out that there are, so this is one of them, it turns out that there are five sort of concentric, it's, it's like this, this object has grooves in it, right? Form, so where, um, where these two fit, right, there's, there's a groove, and then that groove kind of winds its way around this, this thing. Okay? 
And so there are five, it turns out there's five brews there. So there's exactly room for five more of these um, spot, these, these uh, chains of 10 uh, dodecahedra spiraling, fitting, fitting precisely around it, okay? So that's six altogether. Six chains of 10 dodecahedra, okay? Arranged, some sense arranged. If you were to slice across, they're sort of arranged like this. That should be sort of reminiscent, right? Six chains, and that, and that turns out to be half of them. And the other half fit together perfectly so that it turns out it sort of fills up what's called a, the, the other thing, these, are, these things go around and come back, right? Okay, they go off to infinity, but don't worry about it, they come back to where they are. So that, um, th that's what's called a solid torus, okay? If I, if I didn't worry anything about the, you know, the geometry of it, it's, it's just that, it's, well, I can sort of imagine it looks like, um, I'm sort of gonna obscure everything. And sort of imagine that I'm, you know, making my eye very blurry and looking at it. I built this stack of, I made I turned my picture 90 degrees. So I built this stack of dodecahedra that went out, got huge, and came back around. And then I fit five more around it. Okay, and that'll fill out this sort this thing goes all the way out to infinity. I've got one huge dodecahedra engulfing infinity on the outside. And now I can do the same thing with six other of these going around this way. And then they fit, they lock together perfectly. The six on the outside and the six on the inside lock together just like this. And you get 12 necklaces of 10 dodecahedra each locking together perfectly in this configuration of 120 dodecahedra. Um, okay, just quick comments. One is um, for those who were at Niles' talk, he talked about a um, map from S3 to S2. Okay, and um, the, 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 the inverse images of points in S2 were circles in S3. Okay, for those who weren't there, I don't worry about it. Okay, they were circles. So those, if you take, if you take in S2, you take the centers of the 12 faces of a dodecahedron. Those are 12 points, 12 equally spaced points on the surface of an ordinary sphere. And then you look at their inverse images under this map from S3 to S2. Those will be 12 circles inside S3, and those are exactly the cores of these 12, um, these, these 12 chains of 10 um, and uh, that's all. Lots of points there.